Hi, everyone. So uh, thanks for coming. I think other people will be joining us. And uh, we're recording today, so we can share it out widely. And um, I'm really excited that uh, we're doing this, because it's about many teams collaborating. Oh, thank you for the reminder. OK, so welcome. Um, there's a bunch of different teams represented here. And I just wanted to um, kind of call out, there's people online. And Shira's going to talk about some guidelines to keep remote people included. And so you guys can hear. She's going to be your liaison. So she'll be online and watching chat. She's doing. And uh, let's see. OK, so I want to say a shout out to multidisciplinary collaboration. For innovation, we all have things that we can implement to create great products in the end. Um, so I always like this Venn diagram about desirability, feasibility, and viability. And if user experience, technology, and business, meaning our mission, all collaborate and working together, that middle section where that wheel is, that's where innovation can really happen, because the triangulation and working together can make, satisfy user needs. We can build things that we can build. We can also uh, accomplish our mission. So it takes lots of people, lots of expertise. So now Shira is going to talk about some guidelines. Uh, so, okay, guidelines. Uh, I'm going to be facilitating the remote participation. I don't want to okay. um, I'm going to be uh, facilitating remote participation. So remote people, if you have questions, ask me. Um, if you can't hear anything, no. um, We're also going to have a parking lot. So um, the parking lot for August is, is um, once we start talking and we have lots of questions, you might run over time for those questions. So we're going to park those in an Etherpad. That's the Etherpad link. Um, and then someone at the end of a soon they will address those things and you know, get to people all over the theater. Um, speak into the mic so everyone can hear the recording. And if you don't mind, could you please maybe close your laptops and be present for the Later. Gotcha. Uh, yeah, so that's it. Thank you, Shira. All right. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the benefits of design research. And some of you may have seen some of this before. And Jamo is going to keep me honest about time. Daisy is going to say, hurry it up, talk too much. <laughs> so um, design research helps us to know the people beyond the data. Uh, it helps ensure quality and usefulness of products. And also, it helps us focus our solutions, the things that we build around the needs of users. So we do this in many different ways. We have a lot of methodologies. We work with a lot of different teams. And um, recently, thanks to Shira, May, UV, and Jonathan, and the whole design research team pitched into this, we built a little uh, WordPress site that describes a very high level uh, uh, product process. And for each part of the process, you can click on it and see what methods um, we use. So uh, I don't know if this is the right way to do this linking, but it seems like it works. Brendan, is that cool? Um, so here you can see, here's a high level process. And this is not a top down, hey, here's how we need to design products. It's just a high level kind of stages of going through product development just to demonstrate the different uh, methods that we use in design research. And later, we're going to learn from everybody in the room about what, how, to, uh, how to implement where and when you guys need to implement your ex expertise in this process. So, um, so let's say if you click on understand, click on understand, you can you're wearing your researcher hat. You're discovering personas, needs, and challenges, and opportunities. So this is where we go out in the field, and we're just learning, 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 learning. And um, we'll probably get a lot of ideas in this period of time. And we us to like put them in a folder, and then um, we can do move on. 
But so this website is just a quick demo of this website. You guys can dive into it later, and we're going to be adding it. It's growing over time. We're going to share it out with everybody. So, for example, we could do a diary study and learn about people over a period of a couple weeks where they're maybe uh, writing in a diary about how they contributed or what their experiences were like, uh, what activities they did. Um, there, you know, we can also, we're gonna do a contextual inquiry in the uh, emerging market, or emerging uh, regions, emerging communities, global south, uh, people who we need to learn more about, who are hard to reach over Google Hangouts. Um, that's one of the methodologies in, uh, in Understand. And we'll talk more about this process and details about it in a little while, but I wanted to show you guys this website. You can go in and look, like, if we're in, if we're in maintain, what kind of methodologies would design research be able to contribute? Um, personas are always useful all across the, the product process, but we can do things like benchmarking and unmoderated usability tests to see how things are going in, the, in, in real life. Um, so that's just a quick dive into that. Um, so for knowing people beyond the data, we're, we're, we're doing personas, we're building personas, as, and Danny's going to talk about that in his lightning talk. Um, so it's talking to people, it's learning everything we can about the various types of users um, that we know about, and um, and we're, we're doing ongoing research. So we're talking to, to readers and editors and all kinds of users all the time. Um, we did research, Daisy and I did research on how people are learning to edit Wikipedia. So we talked to like nine people who had never ever edited before and asked them to edit. They had described that they had some motivation to learn. So we were able to observe their very first time going in and hear from them and watch them uh, experience their first time. So, so we observed some bumps in the road we heard about their feelings about editing. Some people were um, hesitant. Um, you know, learned a lot of things about by watching and listening to them. Um, we also did an editing task survey. And in the future, we're going to go potentially to Mexico or Chile and um, do a contextual inquiry. So these are kind of examples of how we're talking to people and being with people um, and learning about them along with learning with about them with the data. Um, really important point for design research is that observing pe how people do things is more reliable sometimes than asking them how they do things. Because people build workarounds, and then you just do it. You, you figure out humans are determined, and we all we have a goal. We're going to figure out how to do it. And if the technology or something's getting in the way, figure out how to do it. And then after you've been doing it for a while, it's just this rote path. And trying to describe it to someone who's trying to understand your process is you don't get all the details, you don't see. So if you actually watch someone do something, you can discover a lot about what they're going through to accomplish their goal. Um, how am I doing on time, Jamal? Excellent. So I want to play a, a video here and to demonstrate this point about showing, uh, watching what people do. Uh-oh. OK. The audio. OK. So this is um, in visual editor usability testing that we did. Just tell me when I should push play or if you want to push play. OK. Nope. Oh, that's okay, and I can skip over this and people can watch it later too. I'll just tell about it. So this guy was, this was from usability testing for visual editor, and um, we asked him to do a reference. And you can see um, that he's going, you can just watch. You guys online see, okay. So he's reading the task and he's, um, we provided him with a reference, so he's copying uh, the reference uh, to be able to insert it. Um, that's the copies the link, and then we're going to see how he goes through trying to figure out how to make a link. So he's looking for the spot where he can add his link, add his reference. Looking around, okay. found the spot. 
And now he's scrolling up because he doesn't notice that the bar is there. He's looking for where to add the reference. He thinks insert might be a good place to find it. Um, and he inserted incorrectly, so he figured, okay, that's not right. He probably presses control X. And he's kind of narrating like, oh, maybe it's in here, maybe it's in here. He pushes, see, he pushes the reference button, but he didn't recognize it. And then he added a link instead of a reference. So, and he was not, he didn't add a reference, he added a link. So he thought he was successful. So being able to observe this person doing uh, this task really taught us a lot about how to iterate the UI to make it intuitive. Um, there's another one here about, um, and I'll just tell you the story. I was uh, observing people doing the upload wizard and I just started with how would you get a picture in a Wikipedia article? And I know it's a little bit of a trick question. I didn't intend it to be a trick question, but people would be motivated as they're editing to just add an image and they don't know about comments. So this person went, she's used to WordPress, so she was looking for where to add an image. She clicked an icon that looked like, like this icon that looked like add image. Can't see it very well right now. Um, and she couldn't find the image anywhere. She tried to drag and drop it from her desktop. And she got really frustrated. And she said, this interface is so complex, I'm used to WordPress. So she was not able to do it. What she ended up doing was go to Google to figure out, learn how to, to add an image to Wikipedia. And then she found out about Commons and Upload Wizard. So we also um, do a lot of ensuring of quality. So some of this usability testing I've been talking about, we worked on Media Viewer. Um, it was released and we helped to iterate it down to um, a basic set of tasks for a specific user, for new users. And we did uh, several rounds of usability testing to help iterate it towards uh, a little bit easier usability. We're doing the same with Visual Editor, um, Link Inspector, and Flow, and, and Collections. We've done usability testing and heuristic evaluations. Um, those are just some examples. And I want to show you guys this. This is Bart. If you guys are, live here or visit here, you probably recognize this interface. And personally, I've had a lot of difficulty with it once. You, you notice there's three different places you can, cook, you can put cards, um, or two different places to put cards, a place to put bills, lots of little places to put things, lots of buttons. One time I was on my way to Hong Kong, and I was rushing, as many times people are, in Bart, and I put my card in the wrong slot, and just went in my credit card to buy a ticket. It just went in and it wouldn't come out. <laughs> and I was panicking trying to get to the airport. Anyway, the, the attendant helped me. But So I noticed this one time that a user, it's not only me that's had trouble with this interface, a user, someone put a note giving directions for people about how to put their card in correctly. I thought that was an indication to me that Maybe they didn't usability test this before they released it. So I thought, wow, that's a, that's a costly installation too. This is manufacturing, this is installation, this is a lot of labor to get these all over the place. And they could have iterated a little bit before release. Maybe they didn't have time, but it could have saved them money and effort in the end. Um, so this is just a little example of design iteration. This is visual editor. Like before we did usability testing, like you saw that guy go and he totally missed the icon for reference because it, it kind of looked like a bookmark then. So then we've changed the icon and people got it right away. We put the word site, we had the icon that is quotes, which is kind of a, a mental model of citation. Um, and we also iterated the, the link inspector or the citation inspector tool. Um, so, also focusing solutions around needs. How am I doing? He's writing out time, okay. Um, 20 minutes left. Wow, I've got a lot of time, awesome. Oh, okay, so focusing solutions around needs. To focus the solutions around the needs, we need to know what the needs are. So being able to go out and observe people, talk with people, learn what they're trying to accomplish, learn what they want to do by talking with them and observing them helps us to define solutions that are then, then people will use if they need them. So for example, we at Wikimania, you guys, people probably saw the presentation we did uh, for um, 
monthly metrics went. It was about mobile contributions, and we just randomly interviewed 15 people, asking them, do you contribute to wiki projects on mobile? And then they, we, if they said yes, we said, hey, would you mind showing us and, and talking us through what you do? So they did, and we got really interesting observations about the kinds of tasks that the people were wanting to do, and they were mostly um, experienced contributors. So we learned about like looking at, at, um, at contributions um, uh, and uh, evaluating people's contributions to see if it's vandalism or not, and all kind of thanking people for editing. There was a variety of tasks people did. We also observed some of the issues they're having with the UI so that we can inform how to, how to iterate it. We can inform what, what, are, what are, we'll do more research on this to understand people's needs, like maybe new editors and readers. Um, but that observing is a way we can understand people's needs. And um, in the future, we're really excited that we will be doing some work with the stewards to help them improve their workflows. Because when they were here, came to the brown bag, and people were, they were talking about one of the things they need is uh, to have easier workflows. And a lot, have to push the buttons a lot to do a, a task. And so we're going to ask them to record their workflows. We'll have conversations with them. We'll learn about what they need and how we can with the help of design and engineering and product teams, how we can make it easier for their work, how make their workflows more efficient by improving the UI and understanding uh, their needs. And we're going to go to somewhere in February with the reading team to do some uh, contextual inquiry where we're going to go visit people where, where they live and where they work and understand what's the context of using mobile devices, what's the context of reading and learning on the internet, um, and learning in general, uh, and what are the devices people are using, what's their relationship with technology, what are the, con what are the, the constraints, the challenges, what are the uh, things that are accomplishable. And we'll bring stories back, to, back home. Um, so this is one video, maybe some of you have seen it, but it's one of my favorite, that it's from IDEO, and it's one of my favorite that describes contextual inquiry and design ethnography. So I want to play this. Yeah, it's working.
love that video. <laughs> and, uh, designing around the, the people's needs. We don't always need them from them, from what we think in our heads about what they need. So learn from people. Um, so let's see now. Oh, just a little bit about collaborating with us. There's an email. People can send emails to us, and we're happy to have conversations and start projects. Um, uh, we have a page on MediaWiki that describes our projects and has our reports, and we start a, a stub of our research when we started and then add to it as we go and share the results um, right there. Um, we also have a fabricator board, and you can um, add projects, add requests. Um, either from our MediaWiki page or add a ticket to our fabricator board. And then we do our prioritization and uh, try to keep, uh, keep going with everything. So there are three ways you can contact us, plus just coming up and talking to any of us also. Um, so now we're going to do some lightning talks. And um, Pau, uh, are you ready, Pau? I'm Pau I I'm a designer working on different Wikimedia projects. I have been conducting research on my own in the past, but since we had a user research team, I have been interacting with them to, to do so. And today, based on that experience, I want to talk about how to better interact with researchers to make the best use of research. Learning, learning about our users is essential in all stages of design. In order to create a solution that meets our user needs, we need to know which are those needs, which problems users have with the current solutions, and how well our new ideas are solving those problems. And research can be very useful in all those steps. But first, we'll start with what we don't want research to be. We don't want research that produces a bunch of, a bunch of slides that no one reads. We don't want research that does not clarify or path forward because it's too generic, it's too specific, or it answers the wrong questions. For example, learning which kind of clothes people wear when using Wikipedia is of little use if we cannot do anything about it, or we don't plan to do so. We want research that helps us make decisions. We want research that helps us to pick the path that has more chances to better fit the user needs. For example, we want to discover that translators are more interested in getting a high quality initial version of an article than translating the whole thing in one go. That informs our decisions to support translations on a paragraph per paragraph basis when creating a translation tool for Wikipedia. The, the usefulness of the research results heavily depends on how we frame and set up each research study. And I want to provide five quick, quick tips that, that I found really helpful. So first is to, to state the problem. Defining, defining the problem to, to solve before jumping to a specific solution is a good design practice in general, but it is also very useful when planning research. Planning research. So, I put in, so please put in writing in, in each fabricator ticket, which is the, the problem to solve. That will be very helpful. Stating the problem to solve not only avoids us to be biased towards a specific solution, it also helps to surface our understanding of the context. What are we sure about, what we don't know, and which are our assumptions? Having assumptions is good. Having them explicitly is even better, since we can revisit them when we get unexpected results. It's also important to be specific about what you, what you want to learn. Let's imagine we have a list of articles, and we propose to add a way to delete them. We want to know whether this works. And we may ask ourselves, can, we, can users delete items easily from a list? But that's not a very specific question, since the user is involved in a whole process. Are we interested about the need for deleting articles in a given context? Are we interested about whether users can find the way to delete articles when they have such need? Are we interested about how much users understand what delete means and the consequences it has in this context? Are we interested about whether users can operate the delete mechanism once they found, they found it and know they, they want to use it? All these cases are very different. 
and they require different ways to learn about them and probably different, different ways to solve the associated issues. So it's better to explicitly state what we want to know rather than just asking for a broader question and expect to magically get the answer we need. The second point is about defining the audience and the goals. Identify early the audience for, for your, your solution and the goals is also very important. Regarding the audience, you can always be tempted to think that your solution should work for anyone, but at the end of the day, you need to recruit some participants and you don't want those to be random. It's totally fine if you focus the design in, in one main group and then add additional participants with a different profile. For example, our recent research for notifications is focused on experienced editors, but we want to include also new users to make sure that the new features are not adding unnecessary complexity for them. Regarding the goals, they are the compass that should direct the research. If the goal of your solution is to keep people to do to help people to do tasks faster, the scenarios, prototypes, questions, etc., should be focused on that goal. Third, identify the big questions. Human curiosity is infinite, but resources are not. And while there are many things we can learn about our users, we need to focus on those that are key for the project. The best way to keep focus is to ask ourselves what 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 will you do to those with those answers once you have them? Think in terms of, I need to know this to make that decision. If any possible answer of a given question is not going to affect your solution in any way, maybe it's worth not asking that question and pick a different one instead. You can go even farther and anticipate the possible answers to a question and imagine how different the solution would be in each case and even prototype and test some of those hypothetical variants. Fourth, get involved at the right time. When you're presented with a research plan or a prototype, think of it as a simulation of the final experience. This is the right time of raising your questions and your doubts about the solution to work on certain conditions. If those are raised later, when the building process is about to start, it's very hard to go back in time to check if a different solution would work better. I would recommend also to everyone to watch the, the recordings of sessions, since it's a great opportunity uh, to, to see your products or ideas live. They are fun to watch and help everyone to be on the same page, which will save time of meetings and email threads. Also, there are many aspects about how users use your products that cannot be captured in a slide deck. That also will allow you to share your own conclusions or dispute the existing ones. Share your thoughts because the, the more perspectives, the wider the view will have. Five, verify and iterate. We should not see research as an oracle that will tell us whether our solutions work or don't work. Research is a continuous process of learning. It can inform and provide a lot of context about why and how things work or don't work. For this, for this to work, we should make sure that we have enough stability in priorities, coordination, and room for everyone to participate at the right time. And as with any iterative process, it's good to make a retrospective. Once you have results for one round, check if all the big questions were successfully answered with the level of detail that you needed. If not, you need to adjust the process for the next round. And yeah, basically that's it from me. Thank you, and let me know if you have any questions. Yeah, so we have a couple minutes for questions. If anyone has some, just go up to that mic over there. And are there anything? Is there anything on my mind? Nobody has questions. Okay. Oh. Hi, pal. Um, so. I thought it's so weird to be on the other, the other end of this. Um, so, uh, so you and I have worked together on a couple different projects, um, and uh, and so I'm curious. Um, I'm Jonathan Morgan, senior design researcher. I'm really bad at this. Uh, so. Yeah, it's true, the struggles that you go through. Um, so I'm curious, was there anything 
um, as you started to work with the design research team, um, whether you're working with me or with someone else, was there anything that surprised you about how that changed the process that you went through um, when evaluating uh, and testing designs? Because of course, you've actually been engaging in design research yourself um, without the design research team. Um, so I'm curious, how did, how did working with the design research team change your process for good or ill? Yeah, it's, it's been a, 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 an interesting uh, evolution because as, as you were saying, I, I used to, well, I've considered research an, an, an essential part of the, of the design process. So when there was not research team, I was uh, doing the research myself and the changing being able to, to get help from the from the uh, design research team has been really really helpful and not not only because uh, the team has been helping with parts of the process that I I no longer I, I had to, to invest less time on it but also because it it also allows to to add a, a different perspective if you are if you are designing so, something, uh, you're proposing a solution that you think it works, and that obviously uh, creates some kind of bias. So I think that being able to able to interact and show the show show the the plan for for testing or the ideas you have uh, to someone else that has not been going through that process. Only that it's also uh, increasing the the perspective and and your your understanding of the. Of the problem and and how how that will be uh, presented to to the users. So it, it's been really helpful in in those both dimensions in terms of saving me a lot of time in in scheduling in 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 defining the the plans and also and also from this other perspective of of being able to to discuss how are we facing the research and also discussing about the results, and I think that that uh, added a lot of, of perspective. Cool, thank you. Any other questions for Pao? All right. So now, um, Pao's questions. There's Pao, oh, I'm gonna, sorry. Okay, now Grace is going to talk with us about, she's an Agile coach and she's going to talk with us about teams collaborating together to make a high quality product. Yeah, can you? Yeah. Okay. Um, you, want me, you want me here? Okay. Um, Hi everyone, I'm Grace. I'm an Agile coach on the Team Practices Group and I've been working with design research for about six months and Abby asked me to talk a little bit about my work. At a high level, what I do is I help teams with how they work and I look for ways where I think Agile can help. So let's start by talking about some of my values. Okay, I believe in recognizing and creating value. I think traditional project management methods are more focused on cost, and I believe in value. I think that waste is the enemy of value, so I believe in eliminating waste to enhance our focus on creating value. Next. Ah, okay. Uh, this is the dining hall at Balliol College in uh, Oxford University, and you'll note the elaborate ceiling beams. There's a story about another college at Oxford where the ceiling beams needed to be replaced after five centuries. They were able to do their job for a really long time because they were not asked to do more than they could. I think running your teams at 100% is about as effective as running your CPU at 100%, I believe, in working sustainably. This is a barrel full of monkeys. I value finding the fun at work. <laughs> Next. Okay, individuals and interactions. Um, here's some behaviors I like to see. Here's two people talking to each other. I once worked on an engineering team where two engineers sat right next to each other and they did not know what the other one was working on. And so when they found out, it was like, hey, I just wrote that same line of code. So um, I like talking to each other. Next. Ah, okay, this is uh, six blind men and an elephant. And they're each touching a different part of the elephant's body and they're each coming to their own conclusions. 
I believe in seeking multiple perspectives because I think it helps us uncover blind spots and our own biases. This is Thomas Jefferson. He's the third president of the United States. And these are his 10 rules to live by. It's my framed copy of them. 200 years later, they still stand up pretty well. And number 10 is the one I want to focus on. When angry, count 10 before you speak. If very angry, count 100. Just putting that out there. Next. <laughs> Processes and tools. Okay, so here are some of the processes and tools I like to use. This is the big board in Dr. Strangelove. I believe in visualizing work on a board. Uh, this is the traditional triple constraint of a project, scope, schedule, and cost. Abby um, reminded me that Picasso once limited himself to working in one color for a whole year as a form of discipline. And like Picasso, I think constraints make us more creative. This is the intersection of Church and Market Streets in San Francisco, and you'll see that traffic lights are limiting the number of cars who can pass through to the next block. If there are, I think that work is a lot like traffic. So if there are a lot of cars in the block, it, they're not gonna go very quickly. But if there are just a few, they will flow much more quickly. So I think that the fewer things we work on at any one time, the more things we finish. So let's stop starting and start finishing. These are post-it notes. I just really like to organize my own work with post-it notes. Okay, so let's, that's some of how I like to work now. Let's talk about how we worked in the past and how maybe some of those contexts were actually different. So these are the prescribed labors of the month for July and August. This is from a 15th century illuminated Les Trés du Duc de Paris. And you can see that in July, they're harvesting all the wheat. So in August, they can thresh it. Makes sense. And we do that every July and August. It's prescribed. Okay. This is a general ledger. Um, traditional project management is more focused on cost, I mentioned. And in manufacturing, we want to work in phases because we want to drive down marginal costs. So if there's a cost to setting up a widget machine, we want to make all the widgets before we move to the next phase. This is a Gantt chart, and this is General um, William Crozier, an American general who used them in World War I. Um, what we're trying to do here is control risk through planning. Time is linear in Agile Scrum, it's cyclical. Here, if we make a mistake over on the left in the requirements gathering, things might go um, not so well in user acceptance testing at the very end. We want to find things out before the end. This is NASA in 1961, and you can see they have a big board. Um, the Apollo 11, Apollo 11, yes, space, uh, the first uh, lunar landing project uh, was driven by the hard constraint of the end of the decade. President Kennedy said that we were going to put a human on the moon by the end of the decade. And they got there by communicating. They broke down silos, they spoke daily, constantly, instantaneously before the internet, and then for some reason, that culture evaporated, and afterwards, they went back to their silos. The silos got competitive with each other. Uh, they were engaged in phase-gated development, and by the 1980s, one employee described it as the post office and the IRS have gone to space. Uh, this, is the, uh, this is the Galerie des Machines at the 1900 Exposition Universelle in Paris. And Frederick Winslow Taylor demonstrated his improved process for cutting steel. He was a process nut. He ran around with a stopwatch and he observed workers because he wanted to make sure that they were following his processes quite faithfully. He believed in managers' ability to make decisions, but not workers. And he wrote uh, Principles of Scientific Management, which had an influence on 20th century management practices. The factory work is algorithmic, what we do is heuristic, but I prefer to work with trusted, self-organized, and uh, teams of intrinsically motivated individuals. Plan ahead. Uh, these are two Victorians in San Francisco. The one on the left is covered in something called permastone, and the one on the right is painted a pretty pink. <laughs> Uh, I saw an ad for Permastone from 1950 that said that it eliminates the need to paint your house ever again. 
And what I don't like about long-term planning is that I think it limits our ability to respond to change. So it would be a lot easier to paint this blue than to get all that permastone off and, and paint it blue and celebrate its Victorian features. Toyota, okay, let's go to Japan. All right, this is the uh, Toyota Automatic Loom. Some of the brilliance of this device went into the Toyota production system, which is their culture and process of work. Much of Agile Scrum is based on Toyota. And two of the bits about Toyota that I like for design research in particular are there's the idea of the Gemba, the shop floor. And no matter how high you rise in the Toyota uh, management structure, they want you to return to the shop floor to watch work being done. Um, OK. Okay, so the Gemba, the factory floor, they want people to go there and observe work being done, not in a tailor way, but in more of a design research, empathetic way. Um, sorry. No, sorry. Um, and there's another concept of Toyota, they have, it's go and see, because they want people to form, um, not to get their knowledge and opinions firsthand. Uh, and that's in design research. We uh, like it when the engineers attend usability testing sessions. Uh, that idea has been translated into, or has been absorbed into lean startup as get out of the building. Uh, and the reason why you might want to do that is people in the building uh, might tell you what you want to hear, they might have biases, so you want to talk to actual users. This is a book called Lean Software Development. Um, it's one of my favorite books. It was written by Mary and Tom Poppendick, and they work in 3M, the makers of Post-it Notes. Um, Outside of Toyota, a lot of this thinking is described as lean, just enough, just in time. And the Papandics were able to adapt seven principles um, from lean manufacturing to software development. And one of them is that works really well for design research uh, is um, build knowledge. So um, we want to talk to actual users and uh, I've heard this described elsewhere in lean literature as seek feedback or create knowledge. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, actually, you can. You can yeah. So um, there's seven, seven principles, and um, the seventh one is uh, uh, see the whole. So let's go back to the 15th century. Uh, you can see the artist is looking through the optical device of the grids on the windows, and he's translating it to grids on his paper. So if he were to come and say, hey, I want to test this one square in the grid, design research would rather see the whole and test entire workflows and not individual squares in the grid. Okay. So next, yeah. So this is a butterfly, and the small disturbance of it flapping its wings over here could cause a tempest over there. I think we live in an increasingly complex world, one where we can establish causal relationships in retrospect rather, rather than through prediction. Uh, the planet is being stretched to support a bigger human population than ever. Those humans communicate constantly through complex networks and dense um, uh, dense networks as well, and uh, Stanley McChrystal, the, the general, had this wonderful comment that a phenomenon that used to take uh, months to manifest can now uh, happen in the time it takes to type 140 characters. So I like working with re researchers who are working to understand. This is the inside of Shakespeare and Company, which is an English language bookstore on the left bank, Paris. Uh, I like the advice to be not inhospitable to strangers, lest they be angels in disguise. That's what I like about working with design research, is that they welcome strangers. And they do it with empathy and without judgment. And they embody the Stephen Covey advice to seek to understand before being understood. So. Uh, this is Galileo, and he said, all truths are easy to understand. Once they are discovered, the point is to discover them. So let's talk to each other. Let's amplify learning. Let's create value. Let's have fun, and let's discover the truth together. Anyone have any questions for Grace? Jack?
Here we go. It's on now. Hi, I'm Zach. Um, I'm Hi. on the communications team, and I focus on global audiences. I wanted to ask you about um, how many people you think is a good amount of people to be both agile, nimble, lean, and also representative and inclusive, right? So there's obviously a balance between, hey, we're going to go ahead and sample thousands of people or work with thousands of people, and then that is a cumbersome process, and we're only working with five people. Uh, we're not really getting the best or something that's representative. So how do you find that balance? Do you mean for team sizes? Team sizes. Team sizes, I like smaller teams better. I think that um, less than, fewer than 10 is uh, people can talk to each other, they can communicate, the number of paths of communication increases as you have more people. And so I think that um, the cohesive bonds of a team are just better with the smaller numbers. Uh, I think it's uh, Scrum suggests that it's seven to nine. Um, no, five to seven. The two others would be a scrum master and a product owner. And how do you decide um, just like representation or responsibility? You know, is there a logic to know we have the right people? How do we know if we have the right people? I think the teams, uh, if the team is functioning, um, if people are talking to each other, if they are less formal and more comfortable with each other. Uh, the, the right people is a question of also cross-functional uh, capabilities. You want those represented. Um, sometimes people don't fit in with the team, and it's obvious. Uh, does that answer your question? That does, yeah. It's, um, it's a topic that I'm sure comes up all the time, um, but I think you know, in terms of making things happen both quickly and thoroughly, uh, it's just an extraordinary thing to consider, like how do we have the right, as you're saying, like cross-disciplinary presentation, um, and I'm just kind of interested in like both what the methodology says about it, right? like okay, seven to nine, space five to seven, uh, but also saying like how do you even challenge uh, the biases you might get in a small group, right? because consensus can form quickly, which is both the advantage and potentially the disadvantage. Mm -hmm. So how do you like keep, how do you keep stirring, how do you keep challenging? Uh, how do I keep stirring and challenging teams? Right, yeah, I, I guess what I'm trying to, to push at is just like, um, how is it not all about productivity? How is it about getting to the right place because the team doesn't settle even though the team continues to move forward? I, I agree that it's not all about productivity. I think that value is more than that. Um, I, and like I said, I mean, I think that teams, teams form and you can tell if somebody doesn't belong. But the less formal are, people are with each other, the more comfortable they are with each other. So um, I, can, I can usually see pretty quickly if there's something, uh, something wrong, if somebody doesn't fit. Uh, I don't always have the means to uh, remediate that. But you can, you can usually tell. OK, thank you. Thank you very much, Grace. All right, so um, now Jonathan is going to talk about um, triangulation between <laughs> quantitative and qualitative data. Thank you, Jonathan. I totally saw that, Abby. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so I'm Jonathan Morgan, design researcher, and um, today I'm going to talk about triangulation or um, roughly the process of mixing qualitative research me methods with quantitative research methods to learn, uh, to learn more about uh, your users um, and your product than you would learn by using either of them independently. Uh, my background is in mixed methods research. Um, I've never I was trained to be both a quantitative and qualitative researcher. Um, and here in the design research team and in the research and data team, we actually do. Um, there are a lot of people who have these, who have multiple skill sets, right? And so we found that triangulation works effectively for us. Um, so when I say triangulation or mixed methods, um, in the context of research, uh, it actually means more than just the distinction between quantitative versus qualitative. 
Uh, it also means uh, sampling uh, the way you sample. So for instance, if you want to get a sense of what are the different kinds of users you have, um, you might want to sample for diversity when you're, when you're scheduling a study, just to get a sense of all the different types of people and their motivations. If you want to get a sense of what, what are the highest priority personas to serve, you would probably want to get a representative sample, so you know who are the people who are, most, who are using your product most, and you can focus on them. And then there's all these other dimensions uh, along which you can mix different research studies uh, or different research investigations to get different kind of data. So for instance, there's observational data, data that you gather by watching or watching with uh, a script um, or with analytic software. Uh, and then there's data where you're actually eliciting responses from people. You're asking them to, to communicate information to you explicitly, whether that's through an interview or a survey. Those are, that's another, just another dimension along which uh, research methods differ. Um, and by combining observational methods and elicitational methods, you learn things that you couldn't learn otherwise. And even just by having multiple researchers looking at the same data and talking to one another, you're engaging in a kind of mixed methods research um, because ultimately the research instrument that is kind of the final arbiter of what gets decided, what gets observed, and what get, gets built is the brains of the people doing the observation and, and the analysis. But after complexifying this issue so much in the last slide, I'm just going to break it down into quant versus qual, because ultimately, it is a lightning talk after all. So um, here's one way in which you can effectively engage in mixed methods research. You can perform qualitative analysis first, and then use the results of that to inform quantitative analysis. So for an example of this, something that uh, we're working on right now, a collaboration between the design research and the research and data team, is article recommendations. Current use case for this is for the uh, uh, content translation interface. Um, and we have a prototype of article recommendations uh, that shows uh, articles that are similar to something that could be translated from one wiki to another. Uh, when the prototype was built, um, the uh, metric that was, uh, that was surfaced for the end user uh, to signify the importance of the article translation was page views. Um, and within just a couple of interviews, we found that most of the hardcore translators we were talking to did not consider page views to be a particularly important metric. That's not what motivated them to translate articles from one language to another. Uh, better metrics would have been uh, number of inbound links within the wiki to that article, and also to number of other wikis where that article existed. Um, so right away, we found through some qualitative research uh, some key design insights for how to present, um, how to rank these articles in the recommend re recommender, and also what information to present in the interface to signify importance. Another collaboration between research and data and design research that's going on right now, this week, uh, we, had, we put a little micro survey out asking people, why are you reading this article today? We got thousands of responses. Um, and we went through them, a, sub, a subset of them, and qualitatively coded them. Um, it was an open coding, which basically means you get a bunch of people together, you have them read through the data, and you have them discuss what are the patterns and themes that they're finding. Um, the next step for this research is to take some of the themes that we've that we've identified through, uh, through the open coding relating to the motivating factor that caused people to come to a Wikipedia article and then release another microsurvey. And rather than having an open text box, we have a list of check boxes or radio buttons. Um, and that, that kind of allows us to discriminate uh, intention and potentially correlate that with browsing behavior that we're gathering through the logs. Another way in which you can do mixed methods research is to do qualitative analysis after or in parallel with quantitative analysis. And this can help you contextualize what you found through your quantitative analysis and identify some potential next steps. Um, so one example of this, drawing from the v visual editor work that was done earlier this year, Aaron Halfacre did an AB, uh, an AB test analysis of VE versus wiki text for new editors and found there was kind of, in, found kind of a puzzling conclusion um, that uh, VE editors struck, seemed to take longer to save their edits, um, even though they were, not, they were no more or less productive in terms of the, con the content of their edits 
than uh, wiki text editors. Um, at the same time, Abby and Daisy were doing usability testing um, with new and casual contributors on VE, and one of the key, their key discoveries was that people, when editing on VE for the first time, didn't know when they were in editing mode versus viewing mode, um, and didn't know that they needed to press save to get out of it. So this is one plausible explanation for some of the, uh, for some of the findings from the quantitative analysis, which, uh, which you, wouldn't be able to, uh, you wouldn't be able to identify by, uh, by quantitative means alone. Another thing you can do is you, 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 can, you can try to make sense of a positive result that you may have found. Um, this is a, an example that I'm probably going to be talking about a lot over the next several weeks. <laughs> So, so uh, Aaron and I, again, did, a, did a, an A-B test um, of uh, if we invited new users to the tea house, uh, did they stick around longer? We found out that they did. Um, but that analysis in and of itself did not tell us anything about why. Um, and there's a variety of reasons why. Could be just getting an invite is a nice thing. Could be you know, seeing pictures of real people on Wikipedia is a nice thing. Um, fortunately, we had survey data. Um, to back up and to let us dig into what people might have found to be most useful about the Tea House experience. And one of the things that came up in these free text responses from our survey was that people deeply, deeply, deeply appreciated having a place where they could ask questions and get answers and get the information they needed without feeling intimidated. Um, so this gives, us a, this gives us a strong sense of what are the most valuable features of this particular product. And so that's all I have to say, really, at this point about mixed methods research. I'm happy to talk to any of you about it more at any time. It's what I geek out on. Um, it's my process. And uh, I'll just leave you with uh, the value of mixed methods research as I see it is that you know, there are always, there's always uh, going to be some distance between what you believe, what your assumptions are, or your current interpretations, um, and what your data is actually communicating. And so by, use it, by triangulating with multiple methods, you can close the distance between those two points. And that's it. That's a picture of a cat. Um, I'm not supposed to attribute it. <laughs> it's public domain C, uh, C0, I think, yeah. Hi, Jonathan. Thank you for the talk. Um, one of the things that I, one of the questions that I have about qualitative research versus quantitative research is how to actually apply quantitative methods such as being rigorous around uh, sample size um, to draw conclusions from qualitative research with like smaller numbers of, of participants. Can you, because you're, you have expertise in both, could you speak to that a bit? Sure. Um, ultimately, whether you're doing quantitative or qualitative research, um, sample size, uh, the, the, the meaningful, the two meaningful factors that determine sample size is what you're, the sample size you're able to get um, and the sample size you need to uh, answer the kind of question you want to answer. Um, so for instance, one of the kind of canonical sample sizes for usability testing, right? According to you know Jacob Nielsen, this you know guru for forever, is five plus or minus two participants. Um, in that case, the reason why he's settled on that number is that a, the focus of usability testing um, often is to identify the set of potential usability issues rather than to get a sense of which ones are like the biggest killers. Um, and then two, if you run enough usability tests with you know, a variety of different participant numbers, you can actually quantify kind of how many of these issues are found with a certain participant number and when you get to a point of diminishing returns. Um, but ultimately, it's a mat a mat what matters is um, what kind of question you're asking. So if you want to be able to determine, for instance, which of these two interfaces um, is, go is going to uh, users are going to be able to, to kind of accomplish a task on faster. Um, you can get, uh, you can get a, a sense of that, potentially, by doing a usability study, you know, kind of like an in-house A-B test with, say, five or 10 people in each condition. But 
ultimately that would pro if you want if you really needed to determine with some certainty that one interface you know had a meaning had a statistically significant impact on task completion you would probably want to follow that up with a uh, with a formal ab test the advantage maybe of doing an in-house study first is that you have the advantage there of asking people questions or observing why their task completion rate might be lower with one interface than another, which could save you a lot of time. You find out that there's a difference between the two, um, but don't know why, uh, you're, not, you're arguably not really any better off. Does that answer some of it? All right, so just, just to make sure the microphone captures that the director of reading just said that I gave the best answer he's ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I didn't catch that. <laughs> Anything else other than how great Grace is as a presenter? Cool, thank you. Thank you very much. Woo. Okay, now we're going to take a break. We've got 15 minutes, and um, <laughs> all right, just yeah, okay, work then or whatever. Uh, there, there is a little. I don't know where it is. Okay, we're going to have some visuals with that. You'll see it's a surprise. Well, okay. Restored from our break. Uh, so now, Danny Horn is going to talk to us about personas. Hello, everybody. Are you ready for personas? Hi. Right. I'm Danny Horn. I'm the product manager for the uh, community tech team. And yeah, personas. I hope, by the way, you guys enjoy my hipster slide deck. Um, very useful for me. It's, some of us believe in the classics, okay? Um, personas. Basically, when we are doing product and design work, um, we naturally design for ourselves. Um, it's just it's something that happens to everybody at every stage. Um, you think about the kind of user that you are, and uh, or you know, and possibly the kind of user that like you know one other type that you know. Uh, where you talk to some people, but it's sort of a, um, it's a trick in product design to kind of back yourself out of that. Um, so, for example, um, we have a reading team, and there are a lot of different kinds of readers. Um, basically, we have contributors, and then we have the 100% of the world that is a reader, and those are people with really different kinds of needs and different experiences, and so again, your, your first impulse is to go back to yourself. That's because product design is fundamentally a creative act. Um, there's science to it. The kinds of research that we've been talking about is really useful, um, and it informs the kinds of decisions that we make. But there's also an art uh, as well as a science to it. So for example, coming up with kind of the, uh, the solution to the problem that Abby was talking about with the site button on VE. You could observe people having trouble with that, but there's a lot of different ways that you could actually solve that problem for somebody. And so coming up with the quote marks and coming up with the word site there, that's a creative idea that the product and design people come up with. So, I'm gonna start. So personas and what they are for, yeah. I'll do that, thank you. Oh, great. Uh, so what personas are for is a way to, it's a tool to help with that creative act, um, to get you out of your own head and out of your own experience and to work on thinking about other users 
in, in sort of have empathy for other users, not just for yourself, but also for your team, personas can be essentially like a kind of shorthand that you can use so that everybody on the team knows the kind of user that you're talking about. So what I have to show you is six people. Um, so the process that we use to come up with people that we're about to see, this is called uh, doing a pragmatic persona, which basically means we read a bunch of stuff and made them up. Um, a lot of the stuff that we did was sort of informed by a lot of the research that's been done. Uh, but we have not actually sort of run research specifically on these kinds of personas. That there's more work that we have to do. What pragmatic personas are is saying, using the data and the research that you have right now, how can we understand the user's that? So Abby and Daisy and I read a ton of the research that's been done on readers and on contributors, and then we came up with stories. Um, now essentially, you know, one of the big things that we have to do is to take some of these big ideas, like this is a casual reader, this is an active reader, this is a new contributor, translate that into a person, um, and sort of come up with enough details, like enough local color, that's gonna make people like them and be interested in them and sort of get them into their heads. Um, so it goes through a long process. Um, we took the ones that we had to a workshop with, I think, all the people from product and design and the community liaisons. Learned a lot. Uh, mostly what we learned was the terrible, terrible mistakes that we made writing these. You're not seeing that version. Um, so, because it's illustrative, here's a couple of terrible mistakes that we made. Um, for one thing, we mixed up too many things. Um, we took some basic stuff, like this is a new contributor, and tried to add on to it. Also, limited access to uh, the internet, and also um, speaks three languages, and is sort of bouncing back and forth. Um, and it just kind of, it, it was hard for people to really understand, like, so what's the core thing that we're looking for? And you also start asking the question, like, is that supposed to be every new contributor that we have also has those other issues? We know that's not true, so it felt kind of false. And some of that stuff sort of just brought up uh, questions and ideas that were really just distracting. Um, another mistake that we made was that, uh, Every single persona had some kind of problem with time management. Um, did not realize this until like three quarters of the way into the workshop and we're describing like the fifth person. And I'm like, oh, wait a second. Like as we talk about challenges that they have, all of them had challenges that were like, they're really busy and don't have enough time. And it was really like this obvious reflection of like me and Abby and Daisy like feeling deadline <laughs> pressure and putting that onto these nice people. Um, uh, what was the thing? Oh yeah, so we had to just dial back on a lot of stuff. Um, and now I'm gonna show you what we came up with. So these are sort of the six pragmatic personas that we have right now. I'll talk you through them, and then we'll talk about kind of how we can use it and what the next steps are. So first one, her name's uh, Sandra. She's 46, she lives in Chicago, works as a bookkeeper at a tax preparation service. She's got a BA, she's single, and she lives alone. Uh, None of that comes specifically out of research, obviously. It's sort of local color to get you to like, imagine a real person. Now, the way that Sandra interacts with Wikipedia is working as a bookkeeper. Um, she is working at a job where the computer that's in front of her is not allowed for personal use. So um, most of the time when she's at work, she's using a phone to sort of access the internet. Um, she has... Sort of her job is sort of a, a real desk job, and so outside of work, she likes to be social. She likes to uh, sort of interact with a bunch of people. So the main websites that she's really interacting with are Facebook and Twitter, sort of to keep up with friends. She uses Facebook a lot for, um, for sort of keeping social contact going. Uh, and she also, what's the other thing? Oh, she goes to pub trivia with her friends, and she's also in a book club. And so in all of those three cases, there are times sometimes when she has to look up information um, for sort of talking to her friends on Facebook. They start having an argument about something. Somebody needs to go and look up a fact. Um, for the book club, she wants to look at uh, who the authors are who are coming up and to help sort of pick books that are interesting. Um, 
And oh, and, and she cheats at pub trivia also. That is actually, that's based on research. All casual readers cheat at pub trivia, I'm just saying. Um, so every once in a while, she's sort of looking for a fact. Now, she doesn't actually have really a relationship with Wikipedia, per se. Um, she has a relationship kind of with Google and the internet, um, that when she's looking up something like that, she looks it up on Google. Sometimes uh, there is already the information that she's looking for right there on the search page. And sometimes there is not. And she has to go in and click a link. As we all know, sometimes that stuff, it's called a knowledge graph, and, and sometimes that's pulling information from Wikipedia. None of this is at all interesting to Sandra. She doesn't know anything about it, doesn't care. She just wants to know, how do I get the fact? Um, and so some of the challenges that she has are things like, uh, she comes to a Wikipedia page, can't find the thing she's looking for. Um, and when she's looking up authors uh, with the book club, uh, if you're looking for a bibliography on a page about an author, sometimes that's on the page, sometimes it's a separate page, sometimes it's under different headings. And as far as she's concerned, Wikipedia needs to get its act together. Um, she has really kind of no interest in the fact that like it's different people and they don't necessarily have the same style. She's just saying this, this is a site that she ends up on a lot. So that's where a casual reader is. Our active reader, Michelle, she's a school teacher. Um, middle school teacher, she's 32, she lives in France, married and two kids, has a bachelor's in education, and the thing that really makes her an active reader is that she thinks about Wikipedia a lot when she's teaching, um, and also when she's raising her own children. Um, and so she actually has um, sort of a, a really intentional relationship with Wikipedia. There's problems that she has, but they're all about sort of... Uh, not just finding information, but also being able to share that information with other people. Um, how to help her students to look up information, how uh, to help them sort of understand what the sources are, and just to find like the, the useful parts for, especially for the age group that she's working with, which sometimes is easy on a Wikipedia page, sometimes it's not. Yeah, give me more people. Uh, our new editor is Henry. He's 53, he is, in Seattle, he's a city planner, master's in urban planning. He has a boyfriend, no kids, he speaks English. Um, he's our new contributor. Uh, thing that he really loves is mid-century modern design. Um, he, it's a hobby of his that he's had for a long time. He has a ton of books about it, he, like, is really a nerd about it. Um, and he knows that uh, when he looks up stuff on Wikipedia, there really is not a lot of information about mid-century modern design. Um, I'm pretty sure today, if you look it up, it's a pathetic page. Uh, so he knows that there's stuff that he wants to add. And uh, a niece, uh, when they were talking at Thanksgiving, uh, his niece is, I think, in college now? We dialed her back some. <laughs> she was in law school. Yeah, I think she's in grad school. Um, that she recently became a Wikipedian, and therefore um, she's a real evangelist around it. And she encouraged him, if there's a problem on this page, if there's information that you have, like on the bookshelf right behind you, go ahead and add it, that's what this is for. So he's trying. But, so he's sort of new in that process, there's a lot of stuff that he doesn't know, there's some stuff that he's afraid of, because he's heard that like sometimes people get reverted, sometimes people get banned. He doesn't want that to happen. Um, he's not comfortable with this system yet. Um, but he's one of the, and he's not um, the kind of person that sometimes some of our users talk about where a new editor is a stupid person who we want to keep out. This guy kind of represents, like, there's a ton of smart people who have lots and lots of knowledge, um, and they just aren't able to use this particular set of features in order to share that. So we got to get, we have to help Henry, like, get those facts out of his bookshelf and onto Wikipedia. All right, Adriana. Our active editor, she's 24, from Mexico City, copy editor, bachelor's in journalism, and she's single, she lives with roommates, and she is bilingual. Um, what, she's, what she really loves is the, um, the music scene in Mexico City, uh, especially indie stuff. Uh, she goes to a lot of concerts, she's really involved with that, and again, she sees a lot of that stuff is just missing on Spanish Wikipedia and definitely on English Wikipedia. And the motivation for her is really to 
document the local culture that she really loves and cares about. So she's mostly uh, uh, contributing content edits. She doesn't really do a lot with talk pages or RFCs or sort of wiki-wide conversations. That's not super interesting for her. She just wants to get stuff onto the page and then move on. So some of the problems for her are when things are slow or inefficient or something that she does gets perverted. She has to do something again. That's all very annoying. She just kind of wants to keep adding stuff and then move on because there's tons of work to do. Wayne, 30, he's a librarian, our power editor. Uh, married, he's in Tennessee, master's in library science. Um, he actually has moved out of content editing for the most part. He used to write a lot about um, planes and about transportation systems, but as he got kind of more involved with Wikipedia, he started getting involved more in kind of governance issues. Uh, he's a guy who really takes the reputation of Wikipedia very seriously um, and kind of identifies with it. When somebody says there's a lot of uh, inaccurate information there, it's just kind of a mess, anybody can put whatever they want, that raises his hackles, he really hates that. And so it's really important for him to keep Wikipedia accurate and comprehensive and complete and to keep bad stuff out. Oh, and also he's really busy. I think this was the one where we left, like, <laughs> really busy as a factor in the life. And then Jack, or Vandal. Um, he's 14 years old, a uh, student in London. He has uh, parents that he hates and sisters who are totally annoying. And he goes to school, which is totally boring. He's a smart kid, but he's kind of hyper um, and is entirely bored with his life. Um, he was, his relationship with Wikipedia is that one day recently uh, he was over at his friend's house and they were looking up Satanism, as you do. Um, and they thought it would be hilarious to blank the page and replace it with Hail Satan a hundred times. They were right, that is hilarious. Um, and then the fact that it got reverted like two seconds later was even more hilarious, obviously. Um, and then they get to like see nasty messages left for their IP address. Um, this, this is obviously a fantastic game. Um, and so they've actually come up with a game where the trick is to see if you can get false information onto Wikipedia that stays there the longest. Um, so he uses like a bunch of different uh, IP addresses, uses a bunch of different devices um, to try and make that happen. Um, now, the reason why Jack is so is spend, kind of spending so much time on this uh, vandalism career of his is uh, that he is actually sort of fascinated with Wikipedia. And he's kind of learning about how it works by messing it up. Um, it was important to me when we were kind of working on a vandal <laughs> persona, like not to make him the most evil person ever, partly because like, don't want like whatever characteristics he has to be like this is the this is what the worst person is. Um, so Jack, there is hope for Jack. Um, in a few years, when he gets out of school, kind of grows up, he's actually going to become a really good contributor on Wikipedia. He has worked saving Jack, but not right now. Today, <laughs> today he is a pain in the ass. All right. So those are the six pragmatic personas that we have. Uh, that's just sort of like a quick thumbnail for each of them. And then we're passing out uh, the handouts that we've been using that has a lot more details about, about them and their story. And I believe that we uh, have sent that to all the remote people. Um, basically, what we're doing now that we have kind of a set of personas that have been vetted by a lot of people and we think that we can use uh, is that we're going to start working with product teams to think about how can we use these people to inform those creative decisions that you're making about how the product is supposed to work. Um, so that the team can say, for example, um, that this product is something that, uh, that Michelle, would, Michelle would find really helpful. And then you can talk about, well, what about Sandra? Does that get in her way? Uh, if we add something that's going to help uh, Michelle, the reader, is that going to piss off Wayne as the um, really power contributor? That kind of stuff. So this is kind of a start, it's a pragmatic start, so that we can start using that and kind of enculturating that within our product team. And then the next steps uh, are actually getting real facts to back this stuff up. So Abby and Daisy and other people, I think, um, are involved right now in doing research that then we can use to, um, to test some of the hypotheses that we made about readers and contributors. 
and to be able to revise these as we sort of get more real facts and information. One thing that is super missing and that's really important to us to, to have a good, uh, a good persona for is somebody in the global south or emerging regions. Um, that was something that we knew when we were putting these together that we really wanted to, um, to explain and sort of something that we wanted to talk about. And so Abby and I spent a lot of time uh, writing about this uh, young girl named Anjali who wants to be a doctor. Um, and I forget what city we put her in in India. Um, there's like, we came up with a ton of things, and it was this really beautiful story. We're both kind of sad to lose Anjali. Um, but we decided, like, before we even showed it to anybody, like, you know what? Let's step back from this a little bit. We know nothing about this. We don't actually know any facts right now about, like, what her life is like, what the internet is like, you know, kind of what the education system is like. We are writing a weird stereotype based on, like, not even having much of a stereotype around this person. Um, so we dialed that back. We're not... We, did not actually make a persona like that yet. But uh, some really good research is now coming in. I think there's the um, people coming back from Ghana and doing surveys in Ghana. And then where's the other place that's? Oh, yeah, in South Africa, they're doing some research. So once we feel like we have research to kind of give us a solid base and, and to be able to know that the kind of story that we're telling is more or less authentic, then there will be more, uh, more personas added like that. Um, and so. We're, in addition to that, then we're also uh, going to start talking to potentially some other teams. I think we got some interest from education team, from yeah, community teams who say these personas don't work for us, but it's an interesting idea. What if we put together like fundraising personas? So we're sort of talking to people like that as well. And that is the process with personas right now. Thank you very much. Uh, anybody have questions? Some questions from remote. People. Um, Maria wants to know, she says, I'm interested to know how qualitative research relates to the creation of personas. How do you come up with a profile? Abby, do you want to? Yeah, come up here. So right now we're doing, uh, Daisy and I have been interviewing uh, new editors. So we've looked in data to see where to find the right people, we're looking for people who have had an account for a short period of time, who have done a certain amount of edits, um, so that we understand that they have some motivation to learn how to edit. And so then we invite them to talk with us, we ask them general things about their, um, about their life, where do you live, what, what's your job, what do you do in the day, and we ask them what kind of technology they have and how they use it, and how we ask them how do you learn on the internet. Uh, what, what, do you, what do you do on the, on the internet? So we kind of get to see how they get to Wikipedia. And then we also, for, well, that's more for, you, but for the new editors we ask, um, what was the first time that you, do you remember the first time you edited? We ask them to go back, kind of walk us through it, talk with us, talk with them about how they feel about it, what they think, what challenges are. And so we get to talk with them and hear what they're talking about as about being an editor, as well as um, watching, uh, having them show us their paths through Wikipedia and their experience, talk about their experiences. We ask things like, um, <laughs> we ask things like, um, how when you needed help, how did you get it? What was that like? Uh, how did, what are things that you uh, learned? How, how easy was it to learn? How difficult? Are there any things that you want to do that you can't do now? How, how might you find out how to do that? So we have, we're doing about 10 uh, interviews for each of these personas. And then we're going to do analysis and see what kinds of patterns we see. See if, and get against these pragmatic personas to see if, um, if we may need to split that. One thing we're seeing is that there's different motivations for people to become editors. Sometimes people will see a uh, text that's wrong, when it's correct spelling error or something, sometimes they say, oh, look, there's some content I can add. And usually people are starting out with something little. Um, but then another motivation that I didn't really think of but have been learning from these interviews is that they have a certain expertise and maybe and a friend of theirs knows that they have that expertise or someone in their circle says, hey, why don't you go put this in Wikipedia? 
So it's like the motivation is that their social group is asking them to go contribute. And so then sometimes it's even uh, an editor of Wikipedia who says, hey, I know you know about this. Can we go to this talk page and discuss it? So we've seen that a few times too. So that's something that was a surprise from talking to people. Oh, really? That was my mom. That was actually one of the reasons why I love Henry and have like protected Henry through this process is because he is my mom, uh, who is super smart and calls me on the phone every once in a while to say, the article on William Butler Yeats is terrible. <laughs> like, I d and, okay, what's the problem? It is terrible. Um, and then I'm saying, well, you know, you could hit the edit button. No, this will not happen. Uh, Henry is kind of my mom, plus he's trying. <laughs> Yeah, so we're still doing the analysis on the on, on the new editors. Uh, well, That's true, uh, yes. <laughs> okay, did that answer your question, Maria? Correctly uh, points out that my mom is trying to. Rachel also. Cheers. Okay. I think it's, is it on now? Yep. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Rachel from the community department. Um, I I understand that these are meant to be possibly comprehensive, but possibly not all inclusive. Um, and I think there's going to be some, some uh, situations where, where product teams and different groups may be building for outside of these personas. And my question, um, you know, like, I mean, I, I go straight to the back here with Jack, you know, he's, he's kind of, you know, doing the Hail Satan stuff, but like, what if it's like a game, gamer gator and like somebody who's really intensively somebody that needs to be blocked trying to start event systems, um, or you know, somebody who's just kind of outside of this particular persona. In such a situation, well, how would you act in such a situation? Would you do additional research with other users? Would you expand or consider adding another persona? There's a lot of people who are very involved with the movement who may have like a different viewpoint, even if they're just a reader, and I'm just a reader, like they're a reader who um, is you know, maybe very active chapter uh, and does does things outside of reading that are not in terms of contribution. Like, how would you, how do we um, accommodate situations that are outside of these personas? Um, yes, really good question. Uh, we actually, we made six because that felt like a number that we could handle and get our hands around to have a first set that, that we can sort of put out and start working with. Um, but you're right, there are sort of, for all of these, there are sort of multiple different kinds of stories that we could be telling with a persona. Um, I think the kind of thing that you're asking about sort of for the community team thinking about a different kind of, like, if having multiple levels of vandals or multiple types of vandals is important, and I can totally see why it is, um, when you're talking about that kind of work, um, we might actually build out a, another set. Like, so that's the thing that we've been talking about is, is helping people in other departments to identify sort of what are the types of people that you want to think about, and then how can we sort of um, build a story for that, and then also how can we then do research to find out more about it. So it's, it's kind of an evolving process. I also, because it also has to do with products as well, like if you're building a particular product and you're building for like a particular volunteer group, like that, yeah, but that also answers the question. With, yes. That, so for example, there are marketing personas and there are product personas, and those are very different types of personas for different purposes. So we may need, um, you know, for example, fundraising personas. It's a different, it's, it's not necessarily as much product development as it is outreach. Uh, so, so there are different types of personas. So we may need to build out sets. That said, we don't want to have 50 personas at all. So we would want to have maybe solid set of personas for product development and then some for maybe maybe we need some for community engagement for different efforts outside of the product development part. Maybe we need some for fundraising. So with the work we're doing we can kind of iterate a process to evolve and produce personas for the different disciplines. And just straight up if um, if having a set, however many that turns out to be helps a team to talk about like, well, no, there's this kind of person and there's also this and that. That's actually still a super useful tool for the team, even if they don't have like a build out persona for all of those people. The idea is to kind of help um, identify and sort of empathize and, um, and to be able to talk as a group about the kinds of people, the kinds of users that we're serving. Deal. Uh, 
I have a question about the creation of personas. So you said that you uh, read a lot of existing research to come up with the pragmatic personas, and that for the last one you felt that you didn't have information, so you just feeling a stereotype. So my question is, how do you know um, when you have enough to, to build a persona and not just create a stereotype? And, and are you documenting those personas and the research that you use to create them so that if someone is interested in one specific persona, um, they can go and dive into the research that you use to create. That's a really good idea. <laughs> no, that's actually, yeah, that, that is something. Um, just the second part of your question, like, that's an excellent idea, and yes, let's do that. Because we, we do have, like, all the notes and all the stuff that we looked at. We can absolutely, like, pick out here are sort of the main things where we found something that supports this persona. Um, with the... Um, with Anjali, it was super simple to tell that we didn't have enough because we literally didn't have any. Um, we, I, I think at the time that we were making these several months ago, um, there really was not very much sort of on a person level. Um, we, we had the Global South survey, but that was about it. And then, but now we've been talking with Dan and his team. They're providing some information potentially Global South working persona. Yeah, so. Uh, the thing that's super interesting about the Ghana research is that partly it's a survey, so partly it's quantitative. Um, and so there's sort of things that you can pull out of that, but also there are stories. And I think to build a real persona, I think you, you do have to have a real sense of like, what's an actual story about this? When we were talking to Dan Foy about the Ghana research, he sort of just abstracted a lot of stuff and said, um, whoever that is, probably a student, because we see that sort of overwhelmingly, probably male, because we see that overwhelmingly. Um, to sort of pulling out, out those kinds of insights. So now we're, con we're getting more research and we're getting more data on that stuff. I think it'll help a lot. I just want to note that we should do a couple questions quickly, but we're a little bit behind at this point. Yeah, just a comment, Dario from research. Um, I want to expand on uh, uh, the suggestion that we all made. I think it's a, it's a brilliant idea, uh, even when we present uh, um, our documentation on products or research report. Uh, to tag them so that uh, it's very visible uh, reader or audience uh, who the target persona is. Um, I, I think we have like still like uh, some challenges when it comes to discoverability uh, of our, our documentation and also uh, how to communicate effectively who these products are built for and who they're not. I'm looking back at like, some of the confusions around the, you know, article feedback, visual editor, and I'm thinking how much of these issues we could have solved if we had like a very uh, prominent indication uh, of uh, who the target is feature. Oh, like sort of communicating that out and yeah. saying, here, it's, it's for these kinds of people. Yeah. So it's if you feel affected by, by this feature, that you're not the target audience, maybe there's a reason to talk about it. I think it's a very valuable suggestion and uh, start experimenting. Yeah, well, that's great. We could, we could always, when we're defining features to build, we could attach the persona to the fabricator tickets. and the, So that's a, one way of... And a uh, second question for Maria. These are coming from the Etherpad, by the way. Um, what is the Ghana research, and how can we access that? Uh, so Dan and his team did a, a phone survey uh, in Ghana. And um, they're going to share out a report. Uh, he gave us a high-level briefing about it. Um, and I didn't do the research, so I wouldn't be good to articulate those findings. But from what I hear, it's going to be soon that we'll all, it'll be shared out with all of us. There was also a um, social scientist who was in Ghana for another project. And she went and interviewed a whole bunch of people and gave us a report out about what she um, learned on the ground. And so the triangulation between that phone survey and those interviews on the ground were really useful to learn. For example, um, it was about 80% men who responded to the survey. We were kind of curious about, well, why is that? And we asked the social scientist uh, in a meeting when she was sharing out some of her preliminary findings, well, what do you think about that? And she said, well, 
what, from what she's observed, most uh, in the households, mostly it's the man who owns the phone, and then it's there's one phone in the household, and then uh, people will borrow the phone or use it. So that was um, that's kind of high level of what I know about the uh, Ghana research. Any public documentation or publicly available resources? It's in process. I think they're still doing the analysis and writing the reports from what I... Okay, so it seems like we're all back. Thanks, Brendan. Um, thanks for everybody's patience, too. All right, so now this part is where I, uh, we're going to do a little collaboration together. Um, as we've been talking about, design research and building products is a collaborative process. It takes multidisciplinary teams, lots of people. Um, so we just kind of define this very high level process so that we can all talk about our expertise and where it fits as we work together to build products. So I want to just talk very high level about this, and thanks to Maeve for making this uh, visual design. Um, so there's seven phases here. What? Oh. Oh, oops. Oops. My fault. Technology. OK. There we go. OK. All right. Collaborative process. So, um, hmm. Not really showing right. Um, okay, I'm gonna just. Sorry, I'm not sure. Show demo. Do you know how to? There we go. Okay, so I'm just gonna very quickly go over these kind of. Um, periods of time that we do different things to get to an end result. So in understand, it's where you wear your researcher hat. Um, you're discovering personas and needs, uh, challenges and opportunities. And this is something I'd really like if, if we can do more of um, here. Um, so concept generation, this is a period of time where you develop concepts from the fodder that you got from going out into the field, um, from um, you know, from our expertise as technologists, from our expertise as designers, from the things that we know, concepts are generated. So you make a lot of concepts. And then you evaluate concepts back with what you, you know, uh, back with what the problem is um, and technical resources and other constraints. Um, then in developing, you build and you test and you iterate um, to refine that concept. Um, and then Reviewing uh, to make sure everything's um, going to work with everybody, like technology is, everybody, engineers say, yeah, this is good to go. Uh, design says it's good to go. PM, whoever needs to be, say, yes, this is good to go out, community engagement, there's a check. I don't know. That's something I would like to suggest, and I've heard talked about before. Um, and we're working to do that in some teams. And then maintain is where we're measuring the impact and we're understanding how it's evolving and if it is meeting the needs that we've been hoping it would meet all this time and working towards that. So that's just high level uh, product process. So now what I want to do is um, there's a, um, Jonathan just sent out an email to everyone that has a link to a spreadsheet um, that it, um, it looks like this on the top and then down on the bottom, there's lines uh, where there's teams all along the left-hand side. And if you're on that team, um, maybe if you have team members uh, with you, maybe collect in groups, not, as, not like um, the reading team and the editing team, but group by expertise, like group by community engagement, by front-end engineers, by back-end engineers, by whatever your uh, expertise is. And if yours isn't there, put it there. <laughs> um, Legal, maybe pe people are in the room. So, uh, yeah. And then, so, so maybe group together or, or chat together about it or something. And then um, we're going to spend maybe 10 or 15 minutes for the spreadsheet to start being filled in. And then, um, 
everybody who's put stuff in, like each of the groups maybe can get up and talk about what are the things that they do at what stage. Maybe not everyone does something in each of these stages. Maybe, maybe you do. Um, does that make sense to everyone? Does anyone have questions about um, what to do? Does everyone have the spreadsheet? Any questions online? Jonathan sent an email to everyone. Yes, exactly. It's also on the etherpad. Yeah. It's also in the chat. Under the heading links. Is everyone Aaron's ready? asking, is this supposed to be read only? Is it what? Is it supposed to be read only? No. Okay, thank you. It's no longer read only. Is everybody seeing it? Getting it? Everybody's so the, the, the problem did start on YouTube again. Um, currently, OIT is opening a ticket with Google. There's plenty of space on the Hangout right now um, for the three folks that are watching on YouTube, and the Hangout is performing just fine. Okay, so if you're on YouTube, please uh, jump over to the, um, the Google Hangouts on air link, and you'll be able to see much more clearly. So is everybody understanding? I'm not getting any feedback. <laughs> I, I, didn't, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't get it. Okay, so write the activities that you do in that stage. Like, in discovery, what, what would you as a designer do, Katie? Um, no, it's not you as an individual, it's your discipline. So you as, as a designer, and maybe you and Nirzar can get together and talk about it, and the other designers in the room can get together and say, hey, in, um, when, when, things, when we're doing concept evaluation, these are the kinds of thing, activities that we, we would do. Can you repeat the question? No, it's the, it's, oh, the, the question was, Katie asked, do I put my name in a line and put the things I do? And I said, no, it's, it's you as a designer and maybe the design team who are represented here could get together and... Yeah, all the rows and columns are different. The, the row, rows across are for, for team, for disciplines, for designers, engineers, front end engineers. Hello, everyone. So I checked out the spreadsheet. It looks like there's a lot of great information in there. And so we have like five lunches here, but I, I think we should kind of get through this activity and then have lunch. So if you guys could, each little group, could you nominate one person to come up and kind of walk us through um, some of the things that you guys do in this process? So like PMs, who would you like to have come up and uh, come on up and kind of walk us through some of the things that you guys do. You don't have to say every single thing, but or you can you can take a mic or something. You don't have to. Do you need a mic? I mean to put you on the spot, but I think it'll be helpful for. It's going to be hard, but. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I must have to learn about decisiveness in product. Eel should do it. So basically what we wanted to write for all of these is that the product manager does everything and is the law, but <laughs> we thought we'd be a little more specific and inclusive. Um, so for, see, for which segment is this? Understand. So for understand, we, we identify, we try to identify the problems and the user segments that we want to understand. So not just, so asking questions about things we know we don't know and trying to identify areas where there are probably things we don't know, but we don't really know what they are. Um, and then prioritize 
those things. So kind of give directions about the people to the people doing the research about what kind of research would be helpful. Um, and then in concept generation, to brainstorm ideas and connect them with stakeholders um, and communicate concepts, plans, bring people together to talk about this in Kumbaya. Um, create, ah, yes, for concept evaluation to kind of do the meta work of deciding what counts, you know, what tests to do and what counts as passing a test, and, you know, create that framework and then you know, other people will probably be doing the tests and deciding whether things are met. Kind of. Oh, okay. That would be very. All right. All right. Okay. Ah, that's great. Thank you. And then for develop, define the spec, evaluate the trade offs kind of, again, do worry about focus and prioritization, kind of help other people, you know, get to the areas where their work can be most helpful. And yes, in review, coordinate analyses, communicate results, kind of be that axis and the bridge, release, announce the feedback, feature gather feedback, communicate learning with team for further development. I'm just reading it. <laughs> and for the maintenance thing, again, prioritize what needs to, what's most important to be done when most of the work has gone on to other things. Okay. Um, yay! <laughs> now, who, who wants to go next? How about community liaisons? Here comes Rachel. I'm sure I thought it might be better if I did. Okay. The, the doc um, kept, like, as people adjusted things, like, it kept messing with the. So, it's like, ah. um, so for understanding, um, you know, our first step is get a clear understanding of the problem that the product intends to solve. Um, we need to define the users that the product is being created for. Um, that is usually involving data and, and whatever uh, requests and concerns have been brought forward. Um, I would say we'd start with contacting a widespread of communities, like all areas of, of communities, and, and say this is what we're, um, this is what we intend to do, and here's how you can be involved. Um, we might be looking for specific kinds of feedback, but we might also be looking for everyone's feedback. Um, but but being really clear what the problem is, and being really clear with the. Um, the uh, audiences. Um, concept generation, ask the problem again of what does this solve and who is this for? Um, what do you need to be able to do as a user to help, um, sorry, Mushir and I were both editing this so it's a little sloppy. Um, help users generate their own user stories. You know, as a user, I want to be able to do this. As an admin, I want to be able to do this. Um, I'm going to create working groups of users to discuss needs, um, conducting IRC office hours or other public meetings to sort of gather and generate ideas. Uh, with concept evalu evalu evaluation, um, help product owners compare the new idea with similar existing ones or previous trials that existed on wikis, um, helping to define uh, MVP from audience perspective against what the product team might consider to be an MVP. Um, ask questions like, are there blockers? Are there power user tools we need to consider? Are there are, you know, is, is there some sort of situation that we might find ourselves in that causes a, a you know, maybe a shift? Um, development, uh, getting community updated on planning, data, et cetera, um, helping to incorporate community and product development so far, um, as far as the process allows, uh, you know, if there are a, a volunteer developer, maybe supporting that, um, coordinating users for testing and feedback loops, discussing data and impacts and reviewing concerns. Um, and then once it's launched, reviewing, gathering feedback and correlating across different areas of product teams. So making sure that the things that we're hearing or the things that you're hearing in your research, making sure that those match up with A-B testing. Um, we did do deal with some subsets of users who have a very specific uh, viewpoint. Um, coordinating users for testing and feedback loops. Um, discussing with users data impacts and reviewing their concerns. Um, 
what's a, uh, a go and no go, um, discuss the timing of release with different communities um, when we're releasing. Uh, you know, are, is there a some thing going on in the community that we need to consider um, so that we do it on one day or another day or you know do they feel it's ready um, what is the data that we have to prove that it's ready um, ensuring a smooth rollout by, by not surprising anybody um, making sure that it doesn't disturb any set of users or block any workflow and then with maintenance um, continuing to oh, hold on <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, continuing to work with communities on features to add, bugs to fix, performances to enhance, um, basically gathering the feedback, um, finding out again how it correlates to the data and the impact that we're already seeing in other areas, trying to sync up all these things. Um, and then uh, accommodating needs to replicate product in different languages if it was, or different projects even, if it was um, originally done in only one wiki or one platform. Thank you. Yay, community. Let's see, who would like to be next? Who is next? Program capacity and learning. Oh, sorry. That's you, Edward. <laughs> How many? Okay. Um, I think I'm just going to add one thing. Um, so we kind of already do a lot of this process in our team uh, because we, well, originally our team was called Program Evaluation and Design. So we kind of already did a lot of. Uh, uh, so there are a lot of programs in the movement, uh, education program. Uh, Education program, GLAM, um, Wikipedia Library, all kinds of activities that volunteers do on a repetitive basis. Um, and so you can collect data on that and learn from it and redesign the, the model or, or improve the model based on, um, based on uh, your evaluation. But what I wanted to bring up here is that um, there's like an element of time. So I think a lot, a lot of uh, uh, Agile and uh, Kanban, et cetera, a lot of that is applied to creating product, like technical products. And a lot of times we need to create more social type of products or you know, involve people in uh, uh, doing things with people um, rather than machines. And so the iteration time can take a lot longer. So if you think of a conference like Wikimania, we actually do a process of evaluation of Wikimania. And so, but that, you only get to do that once a year. You don't really get to do that like every other week. Um, but within Wikimania, you have all kinds of different things you can also evaluate um, in the process as well. So I guess that's kind of all I wanted to bring up and add to this. Um, I think for the most part, a lot of it is similar um, to other teams. Cool, thank you, Edward. All right, woo! <laughs> Community resources. Who, is there anyone in the room representing or online? Well, well, go to the next front end engineers. Hmm? Who, who? Come on up. Um, no, I think I, uh, well, for understand uh, front end engineers. Uh, understand what the feature is. Um, I, I would somehow like to so kind of compare compare it to UX engineer, which is um, below. I, I don't know if some someone wants to refer you. No, no, Maybe fine. okay. Um, but but yeah, like we can see, for example, where that for UX engineer is it's more into understanding where the issue is. And for like uh, working with the designers and more with eventually the PMs and and like thinking about the user while for the engineer when it comes to the implementation part it's really okay like um, what is exactly the feature that we want to do and how can I make sure that what I'm gonna code is the feature that you guys were thinking of uh, for the concept generation um, at some point yeah as a front end engineer you need to look at what what libraries, what plugins do already exist, and can we eventually use those existing tools 
and you avoid uh, basically uh, wasting effort duplicating, duplicating work um, to, to implement the feature. Uh, once we've done that, that research, um, we're gonna like, look at the tools that we're gonna select and select them, and also helping the understanding of non devs technical constraints, run concepts, and maybe even extending IPs with small technical refinements at end. Um, so uh, that, I think that comes back also to the understand part, is uh, make sure we actually understood what the problem was, so kind of go back in time and, and, and ve verify that. Um, and also maybe ex ex extending ideas uh, with some technical refinements because uh, so sometimes um, uh, you, you might, might think something and, and it might be too beautiful actually and, and you have to come back to the, uh, to the reality and this is something also I put on on the UX engineers part. So, well. Yeah, work with design. So the UX engineers had these work with design to make sure concepts are not too far from reality uh, without stopping early concepts um, because we shouldn't be blocked by technical considerations. But at some point we need to um, have them. <laughs> um, right, so next. Um, next for the UX, uh, for the front end engineer, you have the, the development part. So um, and this is more about writing code, writing the test for your code and rate on it. And then you have the review, so make sure you respect like everything, including convention, including style guides. Um, make sure you actually like implement the feature you are asked to implement. And uh, they also have security and performance in mind. Um, obviously, it depends on what you're working on, but uh, you should probably have them in your mind. Uh, for the release, ensuring documentation is reflected in this product and for the maintenance, just fix bugs. Um, um, yeah. I don't know if I cover the UX engineer, maybe I can make one. Um, yeah, so, so just for the UX engineer, uh, it's, it's, it's less about like, actually understanding like what the tools are <laughs> or what the, what the technical details are. It's more about understanding um, the initial work that's been done with the designers, with the manager, but okay, what, what, what is what we are trying to do? So understanding the issue, the lean and challenge, look if issue has been come up elsewhere before. So try not to reinvent the wheel because maybe it already exists and look to gather all perspectives on it. Uh, for the concept generation, it's work with design to make sure concepts are not too far from reality without the stopping early concepts. Uh, so we cannot always change the world, but we can, we can do something still. Um, for the evaluation, early addressing UI UX tech pitfalls that might end up in product dead ends later. How can we build this prototype fast? Um, so same thing, uh, um, addressing the pitfalls. And so, how can we build this, this prototype fast? Um, I think I think this is important for the UX engineer because you're not in the actual implementation, so you're not doing a front-end engineer role. You're ahead of that, and and you're still in the, in the expectation process. So it, it has to be fast. Uh, it's not a, a several months development here. Um, and, and and if it's not fast, you have to rethink. Yeah, I think you have to iterate again. On it to, to, to make sure you can come with something quite fast. And for developing, building the prototypes, um, then doing some A-B testing um, and any other evaluation. And that, that will help you drive some, some decisions later. Yeah. So for the review, uh, that's that's when you're, you're gonna, um, you, you, you have you have done your prototypes, you have done some evaluation, and now you, you need to basically um, retrospect and look at all this data and, and, and see what's what's next. So consult with stakeholders, users, analytics, and determine what, what works and what 
present uh, in your feature, in your design, in your prototype. Uh, and from that, you can keep iterating. Um, for the release part, announced features, results, and reports on UX related channels. Communication is very, very important here. Uh, listening to feedback. Um, uh, because you, you might have also um, something, so and not to be blind on that. Stepping back and then ensuring that the key is documented well. Go forward. And for the maintenance, is, is just iterate. Because here, eventually at some point, you're going to basically leave, leave your prototype to work in front of an engineer's hand or, or nowhere. And so, Prototype is not a, a finished product, it's just something you need to keep iterating, iterating, iterating. Thank you. Yay. <laughs> All right, let's see. Um, research and data? Aaron, okay. Hey. So let me start from the beginning. Um, so uh, in the understanding phase, it's sort of weird to have this this phase because that's sort of like you know the point of everything that, that we do. But but you know like it still fits into the product development bit. So we do a lot of reviewing the literature, find out has anybody looked at this problem before? Has anybody made some progress in this space already? Is there something that we can build off of? You know even if it's not like an actual solution to a problem, it might be a measurement strategy that'll help us get at it. Um, we perform some exploratory analyses, and this is really about scale and frequency. How many people? How often does this sort of thing happen? Um, not even knowing what it is, but we can. Still Still sometimes get at those sort of things. Uh, ethnography is important. Um, actually sitting uh, in the space that our users do, trying to use the the, the tools that they're doing, they're using, or following the community processes that they're engaging in. You know, without going through this, we can't even develop the measurements to measure. You know, how often they're doing these sort of things. So sitting down and doing it is important. And of course, uh, documenting what we learned in this phase on Meta. Um, for concept generation, I mean, it really depends on the, the strategy that we're pursuing. I mean, it might involve sketching if we're going to build an experimental interface or something like that. Um, it might involve storytelling um, and telling stories. We can figure out sort of um, bits like traces that people produce that we can that we can measure or, or um, you know, find correlations with. Um, We'll write proposals on what type of research project we might engage in. Um, we'll perform a different type of exploratory analysis that looks at uh, correlations, like what sort of things are associated with other things in the system. And of course, document this stuff on Meta. Um, for concept evaluation, this is much more like uh, proposal reviewing. Um, uh, but in this stage, like we'll review the available technologies, and I'm using the word technologies broadly. It could be measurement technologies. It could be actual um, digital technologies that people might be able to use in this sort of space. Um, we'll perform replications of past analyses. So if uh, some other researcher did an experiment that's like ours in a different space, we might apply that methodology in our space and see if we can replicate their kind of results. Um, so uh, we'll design and review the methodology at this stage. So this replication, this exploring of past technologies, it's really about developing this, uh, the set of methods that we're going to pursue to try and get at the thing that we want to know. Um, we'll discuss these plans with other researchers, stakeholders, and specialists um, because we'll generally get good feedback on how we're applying these methods. We might catch things that we missed. Stakeholders will know how disruptive our methods might be within the work that they're doing. Um, and of course, there are a lot of specialists in various measurement strategies, and so we'll reach out to them, like the surveys group, that sort of thing. And of course, uh, document what we figure out on Meta. Um, so for the development stage, uh, again, this one's like really different depending on the the methods that we're going to use. So we might be calibrating our measurement strategy. We might be well, we'll probably be taking measurements. That's a lot of what we do. Um, we might be running simulations, um, usually like agent-based modeling or something like that, um, to figure out if our measurements are working or to see if our intervention will catch as many people as we expect it to. Um, we might develop a technological information and then design and run a field experiment. We might be working with somebody else's technological intervention and helping them run a, uh, a field experiment. Um, we'll be recruiting participants, uh, performing offline analyses. Sometimes we're not running an experiment, we're just uh, analyzing log data, and so that might be the only thing that we do here. Um, and we'll, we'll often compare methodologies too. Sometimes there's no clear right answer 
answer on what way to, to measure the thing that you want to measure. So just measure it in multiple ways and see if those measurements produce uh, contradictory results. If they don't, then you're good. Just pick one. Um, and of course, document what we did on Meta. Um, for the review, um, so this is uh, quite a bit about presenting the results to somebody and having them react to them and, and challenge them. Um, so we'll provide the data, present the findings uh, in a language uh, that people can use to make decisions about. Um, we'll try and uh, reach out as broadly as we can because we'll, we'll very often have direct stakeholders that you know need to know the answer, does this intervention work? But generally, people will benefit from, do these types of interventions uh, uh, work generally? Um, so we'll, we'll try and uh, hit like large venues for this sort of stuff. Um, we'll iterate on how uh, we're explaining the observations that we have. A lot of um, like scientific practice is not just uh, uh, coming up with a hypothesis and then testing it. It's also figuring out, well, why is it that we saw the result that we did? Are there any explanations that are interesting or any explanations that aren't very interesting and therefore we would have to fix our methodology? Um, Let's see, we'll propose future work at this point, like scoping a research project is really important. You've got to draw the line somewhere, and so we'll have to point and say somebody else is going to have to pick up this project where we left off. Um, we'll often also perform follow-up analyses that are proposed by stakeholders, and so we'll have, you know, Wikipedians might show up on our meta documentation and say, you know, I don't understand this bit. Can you look and see if, if this other thing might be happening? We, of course, get a lot of uh, follow-up requests from product teams and that sort of stuff. This is like a delicate balance balance with scope. Um, and of course, uh, document those things on Meta. Um, with uh, release, um, this is much more uh, after we've iterated on the explanation of the observations and we really think we know what's going on here and we think that we can actually explain what's happening, then uh, uh, we'll provide the data, present the findings in, <clears throat> in a language that people can use to release a product, to make decisions about whether they want to release a product. Um, like a lot of times when we get a positive result on something that's sort of a contentious issue in the community, then it's really important that we make a a sort of clear case for why we came to the conclusions that we did from the study so that we can sort of minimize pushback or maybe even justify the pushback. Um, let's see, we'll write up a manuscript for future reference. This is really important. Um, we'll also very often publish in peer-reviewed journals because we're not the, open, the only people looking at open knowledge production. There are a lot of other people that can benefit from the research that we do. Uh, we'll give talks to broad audiences, uh, encourage others to explore the future work for us because we're not that big of a team. So it's, it's great when other people can pick this up. And we'll also upload data sets to public repositories and then document all that stuff on Meta. Um, Finally, for maintenance, so this is much more on like the, the theory building side. Like everything up until now has really been like testing hypothesis with a product. Um, but on the long term, we want to develop theories on how these sort of products work. And so this is really what we're getting into with maintenance. So uh, longitudinal analysis is a little bit here. It fits into the time scale. You know, a lot of times we'll get short term results and we think we know what's going on. And the longitudinal analysis will help us make sure that we, we were right. We were seeing what we thought we were seeing. Um, We'll often uh, uh, also um, uh, we'll work with data for long-running experiments. We'll very often uh, do the analysis before we've stopped collecting data, um, and just let let the data collection continue and come back and revisit things, make sure that our hypotheses are still uh, supported. And if they are, then try and summarize them into theory. It's not just that this uh, intervention worked. There's there's a reason why it worked. And this should imply that other things should work or maybe not work. Um, and so we want to turn those into theory so that they're much easier to reference. This is sort of like moving from the research paper to the textbook. Um, and then supporting external researchers who want to replicate and extend our work, use our measurement strategies, use our data sets, um, and document these things on Meta. Thank you. Documented on Meta. <laughs> yes, if okay. you One more team. Come on up, Zach from Communications. Fabulous. OK, so communications will be brief. Um, as we looked across this approach, we realized that uh, not all of the sections are evenly weighted for how involved we would likely be. Um, so we saw understand as a very uh, critical, important foundational space, and we'd have a lot we'd like to add there. Uh, one thing we'd love to help with here is defining the audience segments and kind of the contextual realities around the audience. So saying, 
uh, what other media habits exist, what is trusted, what is read, what is watched, what is listened to, you know, what are the other media touch points that surround uh, the people that we're looking at, right? Building context around the personas. Uh, then we would also want to assess, uh, you know, how is the brand perception? Uh, what is Wikipedia understood to be within these regions, within these audiences? Uh, is there trust considerations? Are there familiarity considerations? Again, these things are uneven, uh, so we would want to help build out the understanding of those things as we come into this. In concept generation and evaluation, again, you can see we're leading with those verbs of help because we see ourselves as a, in a supporting role here. Um, again, we'd like to help audience um, you know, work with community liaisons. They actually mentioned this already, but building the user challenge or user story of like, okay, we've got a problem, but how does that problem come to life? What's believable, what's succinct, what summarizes that? And then as we move into evaluation, um, we've begun using the social media channels increasingly to uh, quickly validate or uh, get widespread communications back from our communities. On Facebook, we're able to, of course, target these messages. So we can basically do creative A-B testing and ask direct questions like, what does Wikipedia mean to you? What did you learn on Wikipedia today? Have you ever been on a talk page? Uh, things like that can be kind of assessed and they can be localized down to specific countries or specific language uses. Develop, wow, you can see that the column just really jumps up and develop because this is where we would come back in a big way. Um, again, we'd wanna continue A, B uh, message testing, but we'd also wanna start uh, running some messaging and positioning workshops and again, gathering all of the people who are thinking about that so that we begin to communicate about the new features, the new products, the new tools. Uh, we've already thought about how they're phrased, how they're presented, to be really succinct um, and exciting, right? Something that, again, we would continue down to ensuring local language, uh, you know, localization, making sure that these things would work for country to country, region to region. And again, utilizing our vast comms list there to go ahead and make sure that individual communication leads with the affiliates and the different chapters um, are super involved there. Review, release. Um, here, again, we'd want to go ahead and make sure that we know where we should place the story. Um, so again, Juliet was just with us and she was talking more about this, making sure that we would work with the different uh, media outlets to go ahead and say, you know what, within this market, we'll have a really great way to storytell through these periodicals and these press, and these journalists who are very attentive to this and can storytell well for us. Um, of course, at this phase, we'd also start doing that communication strategy. Um, I hope you're all familiar with that at some level. If not, we'd love to make you more familiar with it. That's when we'll sit down and again say, all right, what's the perception you want the audience to take away? Uh, what are the key messages you want them to know? Let's prioritize those messages. Let's have like a forced list. So if they only understand one thing, it's this. If they understand two, it's this. Three, it's this. And kind of creating that sense of hierarchy. Um, and then on the release point, that would be a moment where we would spring into action. Uh, we would be kind of working with everyone else to make sure that in a really succinct but uh, kind of omni-channel effect, we're telling the story on a, a number of platforms. So hopefully blog our social channels. Those are the things that we own. But then again, getting the community to tell the story of their involvement, what they think this solves, and then working with press and influencers to make sure that the story is told there. I think our last column is maintenance. Is that right? <laughs> um, basically, in maintenance, it's pretty simple again. What we'd make sure is that, depending on the importance of this product and this solution that's been developed, we'd want to make sure we're still asking the questions around how um, it's working for people, if there are things that are breaking down, if there are things that they wanted to go further with. And we'd also like to make sure that it's even kind of established into our editorial calendar as something of a reminder. Right? Because, of course, on our existing social channels, we have a lot of uh, turnover. We have new people starting to follow us on Twitter and Facebook um, and our other channels. So, again, like, it's not that messaging once is enough. You, know, you want to build a cadence where messaging every month or every two months continues to make it something people think about and try anew. Thanks. Thank you, Zach. It comes. Awesome. Okay. I'm getting hungry. I think many of you might be getting hungry too. <laughs> um, so that's it. We're we're done. Thank you everyone for collaborating on this activity. I'm really what? Oh, I'm really excited that 
to learn. I learned some things today, and we have this document. We can keep filling it out with other teams that aren't here. Um, and so we have a parking lot. I don't know if there is there nothing in the park. Okay, great. But there's oh there is okay. So w what's in the parking? Yeah. Well, what we'll do is we'll um, look at the stuff in the parking lot and send an email out follow up um, with that. We can um, if you guys want to have a meeting with us to discuss things or if you'd like to chat over uh, email or have a hangout, whatever. Uh, we we will make sure to check each of those things and, and follow up. And that's it. Thanks, everyone. Lunch is, is ready. <laughs> Thanks, everyone online. It's really good to see you.